Um, just before I get started, I wanted to let you know that I currently do have more handouts being run off as we speak on the copier upstairs. I'm going to go grab them just as they start and pass them out to people who no longer have them. So just to give me an idea as to who is still waiting for a handout, could you just raise your hands? Okay, so I'm going to hit that side and come around. Uh, and I promise everyone will get a handout, so have no fear. Uh, my name is Erin. I'm the head of adult programming here at the library. Thank you so much for coming out today. Just like to briefly mention that programs at the library are made possible by our annual Friends of the Library campaign. So thank you so much. Tonight we are hearing about ways to maximize your social security and the gentleman we'll, we will be hearing from um, first we'll hear, well Michael's going to introduce David, but Michael Alimo is a 30 year industry veteran. For the past 15 years he's been a financial service advisor and he's served clientele around Connecticut and New England as his, at his USA Financial and Tax Services firm. David Weiner, uh, following 20 years as a senior corporate executive, since 2007, he has served insurance and benefits clients around the New York tri-state area. And just to give you uh, some semblance of how great these guys are, before they started, I was like, so help me pick out a retirement plan. And they quickly were like, well, how old are you? Are you married? Do you have kids? And they started giving me advice right on the spot. So they know their stuff. They're here to give back to the community. They're not selling you things. They're here just as a service uh, to share their expertise. So. We're very glad to have them here, and please join me in welcoming them. All we did was show up. It's easy. So as I mentioned before, I'm surprised how many people are here. We've done this, uh, this workshop at quite a few libraries throughout the state, and I think Wellington was our uh, largest crowd. We had about 40 people there. Actually, the room was full, and they couldn't allow any more people in the room. So it's definitely a very uh, hot topic. And Saturday, we're going to be in Avon, uh, which is supposedly the largest library in the state. So they may actually outdo you. We'll let you know about that. So my name is, what's that? Oh, I agree, this is beautiful. You guys are really fortunate to have this. So my name is Michael Limo, and I am the president of uh, USA Financial and Tax Services. And as you notice, I do walk quite a bit during the presentation. Because there are so many people here, we're gonna kind of limit the questions, at least initially, Understand with Social Security that quite a few of you probably will walk out even a little bit more confused. So if you have questions about it now, you may actually walk out a little bit more confused. There's hundreds and hundreds of combinations. Uh, Social Security, by law, is actually not allowed to advise you um, as to what to do with your Social Security. But you're going to learn that it's, for most people, it's a very key component into retirement. Uh, as Aaron mentioned, I've been in uh, financial industry for 30 years, started my career on Wall Street, and I've worked with a lot of the large firms, and became independent about 15 years ago, and we specialize in quite a few things. The goal tonight, though, is to uh, educate you on Social Security and the timing mechanisms. Uh, David Weiner, my associate, is going to come up, and he's going to start the presentation. He's going to give you a little education on the history of Social Security. And towards the end, if we have some additional time, I will answer as many questions as I can. Uh, please do understand, though, that a lot of the questions are very personalized, and so sometimes they're difficult to answer them all, but I will do the best I can uh, towards the end. So as Mike said, we are here to talk about when to take social, social security and the options you know, therein. Just to be super clear, um, we want to make clear that we are, not, we are not employees of the Social Security Administration or the government, and, and as Mike may have suggested, um, if we were, we couldn't be answering a lot of your questions tonight because they are not allowed to. They are prohibited from answering some of your questions in the advisory capacity. So just to be very clear on that. So uh, we said this is educational, and. What's more educational than a little bit of history? In the early years of the Depression, almost immediately FDR was under you know, bruising pressure to come up with some way to deal with what was going on during the Depression. Uh, obviously, we were in terrible straits. The idea of Social Security was, was birthed in the Labor Department. Uh, and the objective that was set pretty early on in, in the, in the mid-30s before 35 when the act uh, was, was kicked off was find the best approach, approaches via 
something that had been around for 100 years, the concept of social insurance uh, for providing security for needy Americans, of which there were tens of millions. So obviously, in a very changed country, uh, that which had you know, allow, enabled the protection of, of needy Americans, assets, home, labor, family, charity, were no longer enough to protect the most vulnerable. The result, as we know, it was a program that they called Social Security. And specifically, they singled out the elderly, the poor, the unemployed, and the widowed. The program designed as a work-related system, as we know now, where workers would fund a trust of future benefits, uh, th those taxes coming from, from their paychecks while they were employed. The actual act was signed in August of 35. And I like what FDR said, very, very no BS approach. We can never insure 100% of the population against 100% of the hazards of life. But we have tried to frame a law which will give some measure of protection to the average citizen and his family against the loss of a job and against poverty-ridden old age. That was what he said at the signing. This rather intimidating, scary lady here was Frances Perkins, who was a very great woman. She was the first cabinet member, uh, the presidential cabinet member as, uh, that was a woman. And probably single-handedly single was the most important player in the context of the development of the program. So as we now know, the program evolved as a monthly payout designed to basically replace the losses due to either retirement, disability, or death. It is now a very important source of retirement income for three out of five people over the age of 65 who rely on it for over uh, up to half of their income. And estimates are that this program keeps about 40% of Americans out of power, poverty. And lastly here, um, about 96% of the, the jobs in the United States right now are involved with Social Security. It's a little bit of a timeline. This sweet little old lady was named Ida Mae Fuller. She was the very first person to receive a Social so a Benefit check uh, for a grand total of $22.54. Uh, and. Um, it was issued to her as a 65-year-old. The interesting detail here is the fact that she ended up living to age 100, died in 1975, having collected $22,000, despite the fact that she only paid into the program for, for three years. In 1950, the very first time we saw amendments to the Social Security Act, basically increasing benef benefits uh, paid out to beneficiaries for the first time. In 61, the uh, eligible age was reduced uh, from 65 to 62 in terms of the first eligibility. And in 72, the law was changed where we had uh, uh, yearly COLA increases to the benefits we saw. So the, the actual funding of the program. Um, obviously, a worker contributes to the program via either payroll taxes, which we know is FICA, or self-employment taxes, which is uh, called SECA. The revenues are deposited into, into two different funds. One uh, is the Federal Old Age, Survivor, uh, Old Age and Survivor Trust Fund. The second is the Disability Insurance Trust Fund. Interesting detail here is since introduction, more than $8.7 trillion have been paid into the trust funds, a total of about $7.6 trillion dollars paid out in benefits. So despite what you hear, there still is a balance in there. We'll get into this in a minute, uh, which is obviously there for future payouts. This is a breakdown of the Social Security benefit payout pie. Uh, a full, almost 75% of that pie is about old age, or I, I, that's a, a, I don't like that term anymore, actually. Um, but in any case, that's what they call it. 16% uh, for disability benefits and 10% which w what is still called widow and orphan insurance. This is a very important slide. And uh, if, you, if you don't know about this, who, who of you in this room has received a paper statement from Social Security in the last, wait, 
in the last three years? I don't think so, actually. They, they stopped publishing them in 2011. So th but the point I'm, I'm about to make, the point I'm about to make is write down this URL. Because this is where you can research your, your fund, your benefits. Um, ssa.gov slash my account. If you do not have an account by way of this site already, you are strongly encouraged to do so. It is a very user-friendly site. I myself went in there not all that long ago after, after I realized that, in fact, I had not received a paper statement for a very long time. So in any case, this is an important site which you most definitely should visit. So this is to the issue of the future of the program. Of course, we're all concerned a bit about this uh, and the questions that we are asked, will there even be benefits for me at a time when I need to collect? The Washington Post, we think, has said a, a sensible thing. They have said, it's important to remember that Social Security does not run out of money or go broke, even when its key trust fund uh, is exhausted in 2035. What it, what, it, what it does say is that tax income would be sufficient to pay out about 72% of benefits all the way through 2087. And I think this is the most important thing. Despite the fact that we have seen huge blowback in terms of any changes to the program, the fact of the matter is there will be changes eventually, and certainly before 2087. This is a little bit of a trivia that Mike and I have come by as we've become you know, particularly versed in Social Security. The handbook of the administration is a very scary Bible-like item, which is called, equally scarily, the POMS. It is the Program Operating Manual System. It has 2,728 separate rules, and in it are thousands and thousands thousands of explanations about those 2,700 rules, which is kind of a way of, again, what Mike had said earlier, reminding you that we do not like to answer many questions simply because we want to be right about this, and there are many, many rules and regulations. So some of you may know this, many of you may not. How is your benefit calculated? Well, your Social Security benefit is based on the number of years you've been working, and of course, your earnings over those years. You must have worked at least 10 years or an equivalent of 40 quarters. So in other words, if there was a maternity leave, as long as the total is 40 quarters, you're good to go. Um, when you become eligible at age 62, the program uh, calculates your highest 35 years of earnings. That data is then indexed to adjust for inflation, very important then the data is averaged into a single number, and finally a formula, which uh, is kind of like a, a Colonel Sanders kind of thing, uh, it's a, a secret and a mystery, is applied to determine what is called your full retirement benefit. Very important uh, detail, which we'll be talking about a lot tonight. So, why is it important to understand your options? That's, of course, why we're here tonight. The fact is, once you begin taking uh, benefits, they can play a really major role in your retirement income and planning. I think, oddly, uh, the populace has gotten out of the habit of looking upon this program as an integral portion of one's retirement planning, but it can and should be. And very important, uh, if you're married, timing all the more so, can be a really key component in maximizing the amount of lifetime income, because that's what the program offers that you may be able to receive. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Alima. I want to see you clip this on here. Can you get it? Okay, 
So that was a little history on Social Security. And there's a couple great slides back there. I find this one to be the best slide. See, Dave and I have a good time with each other. And it's a, a fun topic. But the best, the best slide here, this information right below, this. What in the world does that mean, right? There's a formula that's applied to determine your full retirement age. Everybody understands the 40 quarters. Everybody understands adjusting for inflation. What is the formula that's in that manual? And I promise you, I do not know all 2,728 rules. But we do have a team of people, uh, and I'm very well versed in the topic. But the key understanding here is you have to understand where Social Security fits in. And David mentioned this, and this does not apply to everyone, by the way. But years ago, before great PowerPoint presentations and great software programs that exist, we used to talk to people about retirement. We used to talk to anybody here of a, a three-legged stool, right? Some people have, right? Believe it or not, it's still a very key component into understanding where this fits in. Social Security is one of the legs of the stool. The stool is your retirement, is your needs as you get ready for the twilight of your life. And so when you elect Social Security, after 12 months becomes a permanent decision. So for everyone that's put money into their 401ks and IRAs and annuities, you've done that your whole life with a goal in mind. There's that great commercial that's out there with, uh, oh, I think it's ING. You know, you ever see that commercial? It says, what is your number, right? And so one guy has an idea what his number is, and then he looks at his neighbor who's cutting the hedges, and he says, what's your number? And he said, I don't know, a kajillion, right? But that's the same concept here. You need to understand this because for most people, it is an important component of what you're going to do. Now, for some people that I sit with, high net worth people, substantial assets, you have to start thinking about the taxation issue. So if you're not in the camp that says, I need Social Security to be an integral part of, of what my needs are in retirement, well, then understand what it does for you tax-wise. We're going into that in a little bit. So uh, retirement risks. There's market risk, right? Everybody knows what a market risk is, and particularly in 2008, 2009, right? Everybody remembers that one in 2001. Last four years, great years, right? Everybody loves that but market risk. So if you do have assets, something you need to consider in retirement, market risk. Inflation risk, does everyone understand that? Because I can't tell you how many people I sit with over the years and they say, well, when I retire, my bills will be $5,000 a month. But they're not gonna retire for 10 years. Well, what are your bills now? Well, they're 6,000, my mortgage will be paid off, so I'll have less bills. Well, even if you took that into account, if you base it on inflation, you're back up to where you were. You're back up to 6,000. You need to understand where inflation fits in. And if you're in my camp, I think inflation is going to be pretty hot in the coming years. So you need to plan on that. You need to plan on things escalating at 3 or potentially 4 or 5% going forward. Uh, Health care or medical risks. David and I are both certified long-term care specialists. <clears throat> if you've never heard about the long-term care topic, and you want to be depressed, come to one of those events. Because <laughs> it's tough, I promise you. But if you don't understand where Medicaid and Medicare fit in in Title 19, and what happens to your assets and spend down provisions and look back periods, if you don't understand that, you do need to understand it because healthcare and medical risks is the number one cause for bankruptcy in the country. So not having too big of a home, too big of a mortgage, losing my job, it's healthcare. Longevity. I don't, did you take out a slide there, going back to Ida? Longevity. <laughs> when Social Security was designed, do you know able to collect it? Do you know what age? Anybody know that? It was 60. You know what the life expectancy was? 60. <laughs> you were never supposed to get it. It was a tax, and it is a tax. In some forms, it is a tax, right? It comes out of your pay but you're supposed to get quite a bit of it back depending on how long you live. And the reason there's so much discussion on Social Security is people are living longer. So when they designed this program, that wasn't the concept. 
you were really never supposed to collect it. So going back to, uh, was it Ida Mae? Okay. She had paid into it for three years and collected for 40 years. The, the system wasn't designed for that. So you need to plan on longevity. Social Security, the good news is once you start getting it, it's going to come in as long as, you, as you're alive, right? But when do you take it? Depletion of savings is a big one. If you've never run analysis on do I outlive my money, you need to understand that as well. There was a great study that was uh, started 30 years ago in the early 80s. And it said most advisors uh, said you can withdraw about 4 or 5% of your money for your lifetime and you would never run out of money. That was started in 82, that study. They just completed the study and 78% of those people went broke. And that depends on where your money's placed, obviously, right? So if you have major events like 2001, 2008, and other periods of time, 5%, if you take a major hit, becomes 7 or 8%. If your assets shrink, but you still need a certain dollar amount, you're taking a larger percentage. So depletion of savings is pretty big. I don't love this slide, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. How do you feel about that? OK with that? This basically just shows you an example of a depletion of, uh, of savings here. Again, depending on inflation and the rate of growth, you need to understand the longevity of your money. So a lot of people I sit with over the years, and by the way, in terms of investing, there's no there's no right or wrong. If you've sat with people, uh, everybody has different risk tolerances, different feelings. I've sat with people half a million dollars in CDs even to this day that are earning 1% or less. If you go online and do your online banking, you can actually get, I'm getting 1.2 uh, in my savings account right now. Better than most CDs out there. So, but you have to understand the depletion of your savings. If you're not keeping up with inflation, you could deplete your assets. Why is it valuable? Social Security, why is it valuable? Uninfect, uh, unaffected by market fluctuations. So again, back to investment, Social Security doesn't care what happens. Once you elect that benefit, as long as you get a cost of living increase, you're going to keep getting it every month and every year. Anybody here collecting Social Security? A few of you? So you know there was a couple years you didn't get that cost of living, right? So there has to be some form of inflation. Consumer price index. Uh, it is inflation adjusted. That's where the asterisk goes. It's inflation adjusted if they tell you it's inflation adjusted. Tax advantage income. And there's kind of a, a, an asterisk that goes along with that too. So for the people who are collecting, there's a good likelihood that most people in this room are going to pay up to how much in taxes on their Social Security. Right. 85. Up to 85%. And so for most people, and we'll get into the income limitations, you will pay taxes on the tax that you paid. So again, another important uh, concept behind Social Security is I don't necessarily need the income. And I've sat with a lot of people. By the way, I should have mentioned this earlier. People I sit with on this topic, here's the conversation. Um, I've paid into it for 40 years, and I want it. It's like that J.G. Wentworth. It's my money, and I want it now. So you can take it. And that's kind of the end of the presentation for you. But uh, the other conversation is people in my family don't live that long. And I understand about delaying my benefits, but I'm not going to live past 70. Everybody in my family dies at 65. Well, then take it at 62. But tax advantage income is not necessarily true because initially it's designed for you to be tax free. But I, I don't know if there's anyone in the room in a poverty level, but we'll get into the income taxes. You're going to pay additional taxes. At my firm, we do a lot of tax preparation as well. So understand that if you're taking income in Social Security that you don't necessarily need, that's going to be taxed. And what does it do to your overall tax base? If you have a certain amount of income, I've sat, I can't tell you how many people I've sat with, right, where they're paying, they're in a certain tax bracket, husband and wife have elected Social Security because they want it, they don't need the money, so they pay 85% of Social Security as tax, as ordinary income. They increase their overall tax base on the money they had coming in. And who wants to answer the question, what do you do with the money once you get it and you don't need it? You invest it, right? You pay taxes again. <laughs> it's an unqualified money. You make money, you're going to pay taxes. So you need to understand that concept. Backed by government promise, this I'm pretty comfortable with. A lot of people are cynical on that. But Social Security is here to stay. And we don't, uh, we have a slide coming up, right, with some of the numbers there. OK. He changed the presentation around on me. 
provides lifetime income. What should be considered before electing benefits? Does everybody understand full retirement age? No? So the old statements, like David said, there was actually, just to correct them a little bit, there was a period where Social Security determined nobody was going to get a paper statement. And so that year, the site crashed. They weren't ready for all that activity, so they panicked and they did mail out statements. I believe it was 2012. But you should not be getting a statement any longer. So you do have to go to the site. The site is actually very user friendly. Once you create a username and password, uh, it's a pretty good site. Someone told me last night, actually, that you actually have to recreate that password every six months. I didn't know that. So, so just keep adding like a dollar sign or something like that. Full retirement age, if you, if you looked at your old statements, Social Security shows you three times to collect, right? Age 62, something they call full retirement age, which is normally between 66 and 67, depending on when you're born, and we'll show you a slide on that. And they show you 70, three, three times to collect it, right? But that's not the case. Full retirement age for most people is between 66 and 67. How long do you expect retirement to last? Another key concept, understanding your money and where Social Security plays in, I've sat with a lot of people who elect their benefit early at 62. Do you know what happens when you collect it at 62? Penalized. You're penalized to take it early. They want you to take it early. But if you need it, you take it. But there are a lot of people I've sat with that started taking it at 62, and guess what happened at 64? Need to go back to work then there's an earnings test. You could actually lose some of your Social Security benefit. Besides the taxation, you could lose some of the benefit. So if you make too much money, they're going to take some of Social Security away from you. So understand that you know, if you are in retirement and you're not going to go back to work, that's another consideration. If you think you might work, you need to understand the earnings limitation. How long do you plan to continue to work? What will your future Social Security benefits will be? We'll get into some of these topics. Some of them I'll go through pretty quickly. How may working after filing for Social Security affect the benefit payments you receive? That goes back to losing some of the benefits, and I'm going to show you the numbers. There's some smart people in this room, because I've asked some questions. They've given the answers. Who knows what delayed uh, retirement credits are? Anybody? Right. So those are considered delayed credits, right? So Dave said you needed 40 credits to qualify for Social Security. So what they mean by credits is every quarter that you're delaying from full retirement age to 70, instead of penalizing you, what are they going to do? They're going to reward you. Who can imagine taking Social Security at age 70 before you came here? A few of you? OK, that's good. That's good. Because in most cases, it's the most advantageous time to take it. Most cases, not all. How will my benefits affect my spouse? We had a great event at uh, Wellington, and I had one gentleman in the audience who just absolutely insisted that he should be doing the presentation instead of me. <laughs> and I tried so hard to answer his questions. But again, I, it wasn't a one-on-one -on -one event, and people were getting frustrated. But his basic premise was, hey, you know what? I don't know if I agree. I think we both should have taken it at 62. So I said, OK, I'll go along with that. You both take it at 62, and the benefit was $1,500. I said, OK. I said, now, had you waited till 70, and it might not be appropriate for you, but had you waited till 70, maybe the benefit would have been 2,700. He said, yeah, that's about right. I said, OK, is that your wife sitting next to you? He said, yeah. I said, you're so happy, you pass away at 71. What does your wife get? He said, well, what do you mean, what does she get? She gets Social Security. I said, yeah, she gets one of the two, right? Well, if they were both 1,500, what does she get at 71? He said, well, 1,500. I said, well, then you should have waited till 70. She would have got 2,700. So now if there's one person left in need of income, that might have been a better decision for them, right? So even just, you have to understand that as a legacy transfer for your spouse, if you're married, that's another consideration is, 
yeah, I don't need it at 62, you're right, but if I do pass away, or obviously one of you will pass away first, are, you're better off leaving the higher benefit to that person. So it's another consideration. Is anybody thoroughly confused yet? Just a little? <laughs> okay. We'll talk about best time. So here's your full retirement age chart. <clears throat> and like I said, it ranges from 66 to 67. So depending on when you were born, you're somewhere in that camp. How long do you expect retirement to last? There was a great study that came out recently that said children being born today have a 50% chance to making it to age 100. And years ago, Willard Scott used to do a piece on the morning, right? People turn in age 100. Now, I remember watching it. There would be two or three. And now it's like it's its own show. So you have to be prepared. And there's a lot of people I I'm telling you how many people I sit with, check me out at 80. I'm done at 85. Yeah, well, no, <laughs> not with the advancements in technology and medicine. People are living healthier lifestyles. So you have to be prepared for this. We ask most people this question, and nobody ever expects this here. But this is, look at this, for, for women age 90, is 27%. One in four, it's pretty good. How long do you plan to continue to work? Are you under full retirement age? FRA stands for full retirement age. Earnings from your job may reduce your Social Security benefit. So again, if you elected at 62 or 63 and you decide to go back to work, you can actually lose some of your benefit. Are the numbers on the next slide, Dave? Okay. So I'll show you how that happens. Or have you reached full retirement age? If you've reached full retirement age, you can earn as much as you want. So there's a lot of people I sit with that have plenty of money. They just don't want to sit around. They don't want to pay more taxes either, so they wait till full retirement age, start their benefits, and then you can go out and earn as much as you want. You don't lose any of your Social Security benefit. Under full retirement age, typically between 62 and 66, <clears throat> if you earn over 15,480 annually, you'll lose one dollar of Social Security for every two you earn above that. A lot of people look at this and they get confused. So here's an example for you. I make, let's just make that 15,000 over here. And so I'm 62 or 63 and I decide to work <clears throat> and I earn $30,000 that year. So I'm $15,000 over the limit, right? So I'm going to lose $7,500 of my Social Security benefit. It has nothing to do with taxes. It has to do with they're taking your Social Security dollars back. So for argument's sake, to keep it simple, if my Social Security benefit that year was $10,000 for the year, I just had a $7,500 penalty. My Social Security benefit's only $2,500 now. That's why a lot of seniors I sit with say, I know all about the 15-4, I'm not going to make any more than that. So that's where understanding when you're going to really retire and stop your earnings is a key a decision in Social Security. Everybody understand that? Okay. If you've reached full retirement age, now this is a little tricky. Once you reach your full retirement age, 66, 66, and six months, you can... If you earn over, this is prior, Dave. Right, okay. Yeah, this, is, this has confused me a couple of times. So if your birthday, for argument's sake, is in June, you turn 66 in June, that January to June, if you earn over $41,000, you're going to lose one for every three. But once you, your birthday happens at full retirement age, that stops. So if you're born in January, you don't have to worry about it. If you're born in December, you have to worry about that full year that you hit full retirement age. So that's a little confusing, but that's the concept. Once you actually hit full retirement age, you're okay. You can earn as much as you want. The year that you're going to be turning full retirement age, there's a different earnings test. It's 41400 Yeah, that's the point. So if your birthday was October 
and you had earned 50000 up to October, you're over the limit prior to full retirement age. You're okay, because you've hit full retirement age. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. No limits once you hit full retirement age. Okay, so, uh, taxation of Social Security is, you have a question? No, W-2 earnings or 1099. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that goes back to the bottom line here. Once you hit the full retirement age, then you're okay. It's the year that you're going to turn. Right? If that's your full retirement age. Correct. Nope. But the year that your full retirement age hits, you do have an earnings test for that portion of the year. Right. Yeah, well, with Social Security, I think if I understand your question, once you elect Social Security, you have 12 months to change your elective. So if you're saying that if I elected my Social Security and I found out I'm going to lose a lot of my benefit, as long as you change that elective within 12 months, they'll allow you to. Years ago, they used to allow you to pay back all the money for four or five years because people found out about how to maximize this. But now they've changed it. Once you elect the benefit, you have 12 months to change it. So if you have earnings above in your full retirement year prior to you hitting the full retirement, but it's been less than 12 months, yes, you can pay back the Social Security. That make sense? Taxation of Social Security. So understand back here, this is where people get confused. These, these numbers have nothing to do with taxes. So when someone asks me about dividend interest income, this is earnings. This is W-2, 1099 earnings, where you're losing your benefit, right? Now we'll talk about taxation of the benefits. Me either. Not an issue. Right. Now, once you hit the full retirement age, if it's 66 and your birthday's in June and you've been working from January to end of May, but you've not collected your benefit, no issue. Once June hits, you're okay. You're past, <laughs> you're at full retirement age. It's Right. Exactly. Which I think that gentleman was getting at. Again, we work closely with tax advisors. I'm sure you, most of you have CPAs or your own accountants, so it's something you definitely want to discuss. Most of them do understand this. As of 2014, the maximum amount a worker pay, excuse me, of a worker's pay that's subject to Social Security is 117,700. So if you're still working, 117,700 qualifies towards the 6.2% tax of Social Security. If you're self-employed, you have to double that. That's the self-employed tax David was talking about. Uh, as of 2014, once you are receiving Social Security benefits, lower income earners pay no federal tax. Okay, so here we are. If you're single and your taxable income is between 25 and 34,000, 50 percent of your benefit is subject as ordinary income. So now you could talk about dividend interest, annuity income, rental property, multitude of sources of income for you. But if you're single and you're between 25 and 34,000 in income, 50% of that Social Security will be taxed as ordinary income, and 50% of your Social Security benefit counts as income. Yeah, if you're collecting Social Security, 50% of it counts towards this. Then tack on anything else you're collecting, pensions, whatever else you might have.
Over 34,000, 85% of it is taxable. So again, you have to decide, if I don't necessarily need this money, why do I want to pay taxes on 85% of it and potentially raise my tax bracket on the other income that I have? That's why you need to work closely with your accountant on this. But again, if you just want the benefit, that's okay. I mean, it's yours. If you're married, taxable income between 32 and 44,000, 50%. So if you're filing jointly, you'll 50% of that Social Security benefit will be taxed as ordinary income. Again, if you're married, 50% each of your Social Security benefit counts towards this. So most people end up here. If you're over $44,000 in income, 85% of those benefits will be taxed as ordinary income. Does everybody understand that? Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes. But again, if you look at the different presentation, but if you look at, do, do yourself a favor and go home and look at the historical tax rate, federal tax rate in the uh, United States. Does anybody know what the highest federal tax rate was ever? Yeah, 92% after World War II. And anybody know the second highest? It was right before Reagan went into office. It was 72%. So right now, our federal tax rate is maxed out at 39.5%. I say they're low. So if you make the assumption when you go into retirement that I'm going to pay less in taxes, maybe as of today you might. But 10 years down the road, again, it's another error that people make in retirement, just to assume that that's going to be the case. Actually, a great story. Um, before Reagan took office, he used to make one movie a year. You know why? Because the limit was 450000 so if he made two movies, he'd be in that 72% tax bracket. Yes? Yeah, go to a state where there's no state tax. Go to New Hampshire or Florida or Texas. They're dwindling down too, though. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, the biggest component to tax and Social Security and taxation is, again, if you need the benefit, you have to take it, and that's really the end of the conversation. But you have to understand overall, when you elect that benefit, what you're doing to, your, to the bigger picture. That's why you want to get your accountant in on this. This is why we do tax. You know, years ago, when I specialized in my business, I said, you know what? I have to do more for people than... Tell them about mutual funds and stocks and bonds, because that's a hard business to be in, especially when things don't go right. So you have to understand all these things are integrated, your earnings, your dividends, your interest, your pensions, your Social Security, the overall picture that you're creating. This is a big part of it. Another question? Right. Well, but see, yeah, and that came up recently, too, and then I'll just, I'll move on after this one, but, so, how many people in the room have a 401k or an IRA or something like that? Just about everybody, right? But what's the advantage of it? Deferring it, right? Putting in pre-tax money and deferring it. That's why everybody does it. I don't have to pay any taxes. I can compound this thing until the IRS comes knocking on my door. at 70 and a half, required minimum distribution. And then they're going to make you take about 4% whether you like it or not. But isn't that the same thing? This is part of your retirement. So if you elect it earlier, it's just like taking money out of your IRA earlier. You're going to pay taxes. So. And again, we'll, we'll get into the numbers, but if you penalize at age 62, you're rewarded at age 70. How many investments that you have that are guaranteed growth? Okay. Delayed retirement credits, I'm going to have to cheat and stare at this because David created this today. Okay. Social Security benefits are increased by a certain percentage depending on the date of your birth if you delay filing for benefits beyond full retirement age. And someone had asked me that. So the increases start after delayed requirement. The benefit increase no longer applies when you reach age 70. So yes, then you want to start taking it because you're stagnant at that point. So here, if 
for most people in the room, were over here. So 1943 or later, you're guaranteed an 8% year in increase on your money. And you have to look at Social Security as, again, a key component, right? So they're saying if you wait, we'll give you an additional 8% a year. It's a pretty good rate of return with no market risk. If we go back to the other slide, no market risk, right? What's the downfall? Come on, somebody. The downfall is you don't live long enough, right? But are you going to complain at that point? <laughs> no. <laughs> and your spouse will be happy that you waited if you're married. If you're single, you're not going to complain. But can you afford to do it? That's the question. Yeah? So you earn 40, uh, 40 quarters of credits, right? You have to work 10 years of 40 quarters. So each quarter that you're delaying, I kind of skipped that, but. Yeah, the monthly rate is two thirds of one percent. So you don't have to wait till seventy, right? No, you have to earn your forty quarters. This talks about full retirement age. Once you hit age sixty-six, if you qualify for a benefit, yeah, you have to get the forty quarters. Yeah, yeah. So if you don't have the forty quarters, you don't qualify. This doesn't pertain to you. Right. Now, you're not adding credits, but basically they're calculating time. They're not calculating dollars, they're calculating time. So you don't have to wait per year, by the way. You can take it at 67, 68 in two months. It's two-thirds uh, percentage every month. Where else can you earn 8%? We just went over that, creating more income while waiting. Spousal benefits. So. Someone here, someone said file and suspend. So some of the strategies are called file and suspend in restricted applications. Okay, has anybody ever heard of that? You have? Okay, good. And you can learn about it on their site. Their site is pretty good. So you can type in certain keywords and file and suspend. I was talking to someone about it earlier. It's a pretty simple concept. It's just a matter of when you do it and can you afford to do it. And I'll give you an example of it, okay? So file and suspend says we have a couple, we have some examples coming up, but you wait, file and suspend, and a restricted application. So it's out, in fact, I'll just, I'll help you understand it, then I'll show you the examples. File and suspend says I'm married, I go into Social Security, and I fill out the paperwork and I file, and immediately I look at the person across the desk and say, okay, now I want to suspend it. Sounds weird, right? But they know exactly what you're doing. So now you've registered for your benefit and then you've just stopped it. And the next day your spouse goes in there and files a restricted application which allows your spouse to collect half of your benefit. That's one of the, the more popular strategies. I'll show you some examples of it. That's where the spousal benefit comes in. Spousal benefit also comes in if you're divorced, if you're widowed. We have some handouts on that for anybody that's divorced or widowed. So we can show you some examples. I won't go into great detail on those though. Survivor benefits and benefits for divorced spouses. File and suspend the restricted applications. Okay, a strategy for singles. If you've reached full retirement age, but not yet age 70, you can apply to begin receiving your Social Security benefits. At the same time, you may ask Social Security to suspend those benefit payments until any point you choose up to through age 70. Married couples, if you and your current spouse are full retirement age, one of you, typically the higher earner, may file for retirement benefits now and then have the payment suspended through any point to age 70. So we're going to get into one example, but it doesn't show very well on the illustration, so I'm going to kind of explain that to you. So you have a husband and wife, and they're both 66 years old, and the husband qualifies for... 2500 and the wife qualifies for 1400 okay? So the husband goes in and files and suspends, and the wife goes in the next day and files a restricted application. That allows the wife to collect $1,200, the spousal benefit, half of the husband's benefit. We'll assume the husband is the higher earner. They both then defer their payments out to age 70 and take advantage of that 8% a year. So what came up at one of the last events is the gentleman said to me, well, why don't we just both wait till age 70 then? 
well, why would you want to miss out on that $1,200 for four years? You're still deferring both of those benefits. So that's what file and suspend is all about. You get half of your spouses. Yep. I'm going to show you an example in a minute, but it just doesn't come up very good on here. <clears throat> the other spouse is entitled to file for his other spouse's benefit, which is calculated at 50% of the higher earning spouse. So the lower earning spouse, it doesn't work well. The spouse then files a restricted application on his or her own Social Security, enabling him to grow, him or her to grow that benefit to age 70. So what we're going to do at the end is we're going to give you an opportunity to take advantage of the report. We don't charge you for it. We'll run the report for you. It will make a lot more sense when you look at it. A little tough to illustrate up here. If you're divorced, but your marriage lasted 10 years or longer, you can receive benefits from your ex-spouse's record, even if he or she is remarried. If you're unmarried, so you get divorced, you don't remarry, you can actually still claim on your spouse. It's a good way to get back at them. <laughs> but they don't know it. <laughs> they don't know you're collecting on their benefit. 62 or older, unless there's a disability. Your ex-spouse is entitled to Social Security retirement benefits. So you don't actually affect your ex-spouse on what they do, what strategy they pick. You're still entitled to half their benefits, but you have to be married for 10 years and divorced for two years. Okay, the benefit you're entitled to receive based on your own work is less than the benefit you receive based on your ex-spouse. So that's kind of what I was going back to that illustration is, if my spousal benefit's 1,000, but I'm entitled to 1,200, then it doesn't work. So your spouse had to have been the higher earner, basically. Your benefit as a divorced spouse is equal to one half of your ex-spouse's full retirement amount or disability benefit if you start receiving benefits at your full retirement age. Anybody in the room divorce? That's cool. Okay. So not too many. So we... <laughs> We have handouts on that, so Dave, maybe if you want to go over to Dave, he'll give you a little more information on that. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, if it doesn't apply to a lot of people. If you remar uh, remarry, you generally cannot collect the benefit from your former spouse, unless you get divorced again. <laughs> so you can start collecting it, get remarried, you lose the benefit, and if you get divorced again, you go back to collecting it. Yeah. And unless you're married for 10 years both times, then it gets really interesting. No, but again, that goes back to that strategy. You may want to delay. So even if you're divorced, you don't have to be married. You can still use the delay tactic, collect half of the spousal benefit, and suspend yours and allow it to grow. So I just, I just show this because you don't have to be married for those strategies. Yeah. <laughs> hey. hey, he made it to 92. That goes back to that longevity. <laughs> If your ex-spouse has not applied for benefits, but you qualify for them, you can receive benefits. So your spouse doesn't have to have elected his benefits for you to qualify for them. And all kidding aside, your ex-spouse would never know that you're doing it. You do need it, some information for, to, to provide Social Security to prove that you were actually married to that person, because otherwise everybody's married to Bill Gates. Wow, that's, that's a little heavy for me, to be honest with you. <laughs> I don't want to touch that one. <laughs> Did you really? I don't know. I don't know. I'll be honest with you when I don't know that one I don't know. Um, for married couples, 728 different combinations. That's in that POMS manual. So a substantial amount of options available for you. We can show you that in the report if you're interested. Again, Social Security, to be fair, so we have some fun with Social Security. They're not going to spend the time, nor are they actually trained for this. It's just not fair to them. I mean, how much time would they spend with each individual, 19,000 baby boomers retiring every day for the next 10 to 12 years, that went in and said, hey, listen, can you explain at least 700 of these to me? It's just not going to happen. 
Best options, Social Security benefits analysis, which we could provide for you. We're not going to charge you for it again. This, we're not, as Aaron had mentioned, we're not here to sell you anything. We're happy to give it to you if you're interested in it. We'd need a little information from you. Deciding on uh, which Social Security benefit options would be best for a couple based on the retirement plans, teach how to maximize it. Okay. So here's uh, Jane and James Smith. James, currently age 61, Social Security benefit would be 2,500 at 66, which is what? His full retirement age, right? Jane's a year younger, and she would be 2,100 at 66. The dilemma is how to maximize it and whether to take it at 62. And this is what I told you you're not going to be able to see very well. Nothing I can do about that, I'm sorry. This is kind of what the report looks like. The report is going to lay out all these years based on life expectancy. We usually take it out to age 90. Here's the bottom line, though. With the, this, is actually, this was a real case. Obviously, their names were Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Maximizing the benefit returned $990,000 based on life expectancy. They were looking at 868000 taking it at age 62. So it was a $120,000 difference. And again, going back to survivorship benefit, what's better for the spouse, leaving a larger benefit. So it's $122,000 um, that they were thinking about taking at age 62. That's, well, that's kind of what the report generates for you. <clears throat> It'll pick kind of the sweet spot when you to take a look at it. Obviously, when you employ these type of strategies, you need income, right? You need to have sources of income to deal with this. Choosing the right Social Security election may be the most important decision of your retirement. You may want to defer your benefits to maximize future retirement incomes, multitude of options, and we can teach you how to get the most out of it. All right, so. In there, there's two evaluation forms. The library would like you to fill out one. And then we would like you to fill out one. And the one that you fill out for us, if we did a good job, put my name next to it. If we didn't do a good job, put Dave's name next to it. And uh, if you're interested in the report, we'd be happy to do it for you. If not, we thank you for attending. We have a few minutes. If you'd, if you'd like me to answer a few more questions, I'd be happy to try. Mm -hmm. so it's not a retirement savings to avoid that? Uh, Single, yes. Yeah. But then you have to de figure out what advantage are you losing by not filing jointly. Because one of you are taking deductions. Can't share the deductions at that point, whether it be mortgage interest or whatever the case is. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are, and one of the disadvantages of, of the spousal benefit, which, again, we don't want to go into too much detail. If the spouse elects the spousal benefit prior to their full retirement age, then that's your permanent benefit for the spouse. So if your spouse were not full retirement age and she elects half of your benefit, it may be higher than her current offering, but once she elects it, that's the benefit she gets because she elected it prior to full retirement age. So there's, there's, that's why I say it's very specific for each individual. If your wife hits full retirement age and you're 67 or 68 and you've suspended yours, then she could take the spousal benefit, defer hers, and then maximize it. But if she takes it prior to her full retirement age, it's basically, that's her benefit for life other than COLAs. Okay? You have to do it within the first year. If you've elected it and it's past a year, you used to, they, I've, I've seen people years ago pay back four years, five years. Can't do it anymore. It's 12 months now. So. Yep. 
as far I'm sorry, the average? Well, you said it's probably the same as the twenty-five years on average. Right. Right. I'm gonna defer that to Dave because that's Dave's portion. And the averaging on the Social Security benefit is is thirty-five or forty years, the averaging. Thirty-five. Thirty-five. Highest three years of income? No. Yeah, that refers to most pensions with the state and federal governments. They do something called a high three. It's how they calculate your pension. Social Security doesn't calculate your Social Security benefit on three years. 35 years, yeah. So you're CSRS, I'm certified with federal workers. I know all about your system. There's the windfall elimination provision. There's a lot of calculations that go into it. They will reduce her pension. To answer your question, they'll reduce her pension. Yeah, and then they'll reduce her pension equally. You, you don't, there is none. <laughs> there is none, because the coal is on a CSRS worker, average about 2.75%, but they will reduce your pension. They really don't because the old civil service system, not to get into your, your wife's situation, retire up to 80% of their gross pay if they put in 40 years and 11 months. That's why they don't pay into Social Security. Everything they've put into their pension is calculated toward that pension. The new federal workers, which are called federal uh, FERS, uh, pay into Social Security and get a pension, but their pension max out at 40%. So she can take your benefit, but she'll lose it in the pension. If you have 40 quarters, you could qualify for her own Social Security benefit. I've never seen it be more than three or 400 bucks. It gets reduced. But I've seen it. You could get a Social Security benefit if you have 40 quarters, but I've never seen it more than three or 400 dollars. Right? Nope, there's no earnings limitations. You can make as much as you want. Then you just have to think about the taxation of it. Not at age 70. Nope, not at age 70. You've, you've uh, maximized your benefit. It's as high as it's ever going. Yes. As long as you haven't elected it. Yeah, if you ever remember, remember the old statements, it would list all the years that you made money. Yeah, so if you're still working 66, it will still go towards your calculation. It's not going to change dramatically, though. The only time your benefit really changes dramatically is if you stop working prior to one of those years, or if you earn substantially more, then you'll see the benefit go higher. But otherwise, it doesn't change that much.